All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's 12 noon in Los Angeles, and we really appreciate everyone coming together for our end of year uh, Enigma Consortium uh, call. So just a quick agenda for the day. We'll try and wrap this up in 60 minutes. Uh, I'll try and keep metronomically on time so that we have a little bit of time for discussion uh, at the end. Uh, we'll talk about new working groups and initiatives in Enigma. There are seven of them. Um, if you have any uh, comments or ideas, please, please do uh, jot them down in the chat uh, during the call. The ideas are very, very welcome. Uh, we'll update you on grants, uh, active, pending, and planned for 2023. Uh, we'll talk about uh, publications. We'll have a quick guided tour of the 71 publications in, in 2022, which is not bad. Um, we'll spend maybe 15 minutes on methods. So there's a number of methods that are either new or valuable to try across many working groups. So I'll try and give you an update of, of how that's going for the different methods that are being used. A quick update on diffusion MRI, um, and a, an update on genetic studies, including genome-wide association studies and copy number variant studies, uh, including a, a mind-blowing finding. So that, that's uh, going to be uh, presented a little bit later on, a really interesting genetic finding. Um, we'll give 20 minutes of updates on the clinical working groups of Enigma, and then go on to some cross-disorder, cross-modality work, uh, and some new tools. And then a few uh, highlights at the end, uh, notably future Enigma meetings and symposia. And again, in about 60 minutes, we'll have a photo. So if you want to turn your Zoom camera on at, uh, at, at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific in an hour, uh, we'll have a picture. And then we'll leave the, the line open uh, at the end for, for any questions, any other business, if folks want to uh, update uh, everyone on, on uh, something that we might have omitted. So here's an overview of where Enigma is. Um, <laughs> excuse me, Enigma is 13. It was launched in December uh, 2009 and now has 2,000 members from 45 countries, uh, all working in uh, 55 working groups. And now um, across Enigma, I think we've all collectively uh, analyzed a little over 100,000 data sets. The working groups, as you know, have uh, 32 clinical uh, foci. There are five groups on aging and development, uh, six groups on genomics and genetic disorders, and then 14 groups dedicated to algorithmic development uh, and supporting the use of uh, different workflows across the clinical groups. Now, a huge number of papers accepted or published this year, including 32 in this rather wonderful human brain mapping uh, special issue. Uh, all of the links in this presentation, uh, you should be able to click on um, and, and uh, you'll be more than welcome to share this with your working group members uh, after the call. So here's a rather splendid diagram that uh, uh, Sophia Tomopoulos has, has made. You'll see the Enigma groups, at least the clinical ones, uh, are divided into neurology, psychiatry, neurodevelopment, uh, infectious disease. There are also some uh, newer groups I'll talk about in a minute that aren't listed here. And then the algorithmic development groups at the, at the top uh, include various image processing and, and genetic analysis uh, modalities. So here's where all of the researchers are, a uh, rather wonderful, uh, diverse uh, set of scientists across the world working uh, collaboratively. Um, and again, if you are giving a talk about your work, I mean, please do feel free to use these slides as an intro uh, to the things that you're presenting. Six new working groups uh, this year. Um, this first one, Enigma Environment, uh, is led by Lauren Salmon and Megan Herting and JC Chen. And the goal is to link brain MRI metrics to measures of environmental exposure, such as air pollution. So they have 50 cohorts across 19 countries and five continents, um, analyzing uh, 51,000 uh, MRI data sets. Now, just to explain a little bit about what, what you can do with this, if you have um, essentially um, MRI data uh, and you'd like uh, exposures mapped to that, uh, this is done via geocoding. So here's John Wilson. He directs the USC Spatial Sciences Institute. Um, even though there's no globally applicable address format that works internationally, um, they're working to perform centralized geocoding where sites that can share home addresses will have uh, geospatial coordinates attached. And then what you can do, and many of you are familiar with this, uh, Dr. Randall Martin at WashU St. Louis will help to um, relate those spatial observations to ambient data on pollution, in this case, uh, uh, particulate matter that might affect uh, health and in particular brain health. And you can imagine any number of uh, geospatial maps can then be related to the brain data. So this is a new grant, uh, R01 funded by uh, NIHS and, and NIA in the United States uh, to look at adverse effects of NO2 PM2.5, which are particulate matter uh, components of pollution. 
And then also to see how these pollutants interact with biopsychosocial factors uh, that might influence aging uh, and also gray and white matter trajectories across the lifespan. So if you're interested, do uh, email Teresa Monreal, who is the Enigma Environment Pro Project uh, Manager. And there's a form uh, linked at the bottom there that you can uh, fill out. Enigma Tourette, another new group led by Perry Pascu and, and Kevin Black. Uh, this is now funded by an NINDS uh, R01. They're examining Tourette syndrome uh, using imaging in 12 countries. Uh, they also completed a Tourette syndrome GWAS in 40 countries, a very, very accomplished group of people. And you can see in the review that I've uh, uh, screenshotted here, uh, there's a sort of roadmap to the types of things uh, that the Tourette group is, is uh, doing. They've already had many, many calls this year. And uh, there's a picture uh, that Perry sent of the group meeting in Lausanne uh, in September. New group uh, on neuromodulation was launched by Dr. Taylor Kuhn from UCLA uh, and his colleagues who you see at the top right there. This focuses on all kinds of neuromodulation from a variety of different uh, perspectives, deep brain stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial focused ultrasound, uh, uh, transcranial oscillating current and direct current stimulation, uh, vagal nerve stimulation, and also a group on the machine learning and artificial intelligence aspects uh, of these. If you're interested in this, uh, there's a lot of interest in this in, in OCD, major depression, and Parkinson's. Uh, the goals um, are to compare and contrast how different neuromodulatory uh, approaches affect brain systems. Uh, there's an interest in the functional neuroanatomy of modulation. Uh, many of you know that uh, TMS, for example, can be targeted uh, to, to, uh, based on brain imaging. Uh, and then also to try and understand how the stimulus and target parameters might relate to outcomes in neurology and psychiatry. So they have two projects underway uh, on TMS response, uh, led by Andre Zuckman, Danny Pine, and colleagues and also one by Jonathan Repler uh, on structural connectomic predictors of TMS response. Neurofeedback group kicked off this morning. Wonderful effort. Uh, David Linden uh, and David Mailer uh, have 13 sites participating with existing data across all of the disorders you see here. Um, if you're interested in this, um, do fill out the survey, um, and they'll be having a, another call in the new year, um, really trying to facilitate collaborative data science across uh, different uh, neurofeedback uh, approaches, which, as you can imagine, involves a great deal of harmonization uh, and discussion. And there's a snapshot from this morning's uh, call four hours ago. Enigma Chronic Pain, this group is led by uh, Jan Kide and uh, Sylvia Gustin uh, in Australia to bring together chronic pain research groups for large-scale studies uh, of the brain structure and function and molecular underpinnings of chronic pain. Uh, there's an effort to identify brain regions and networks involved in the neurobiology of chronic pain, uh, and also understand how comorbid disorders, uh, as many of you know, um, chronic pain is also associated with anxiety, MDD, may result from uh, brain injury, for example. And so there's a great deal of interest, uh, 18 sites have already signed up, and do fill out the data query poll uh, if you're interested in this. Another effort uh, by Asta Harburg in uh, Trondheim in Norway uh, is to form uh, a group interested in preterm birth. Now this is based on an existing collaboration, uh, APIC, uh, but she would like to include um, more neuroimaging researchers to study the impact of uh, gestational age and preterm birth on uh, uh, brain and health outcomes across the lifespan, not just in, in uh, children, but also uh, in terms of risk for other disorders, as you know, ADHD and many other conditions. Uh, the risk for them is increased by uh, preterm birth. And again, there's a data query poll that you can uh, fill out if you're interested. And then finally, a new initiative on endocrinology, hormones, and puberty. So this distinguished cast of folks who work in this area are listed at the bottom. And they would like to ask if you have any measures on um, sex hormones. It could be plasma markers. It could be uh, exogenous uh, hormone use contraceptives, for example. And they're interested in feedback and comments on what types of projects might be interesting to do uh, relating these metrics to uh, structural diffusion and resting state fMRI. A quick survey of grants that Enigma is supported by 28 uh, different uh, grants. Um, these are the ones that are active right now, the, the 20 of them here. And, and congratulations to all of you who've uh, brought in this funding. Just a few observations. Uh, eight of them are funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health uh, in the US, uh, six by the Neurology Institute, NINDS, uh, three uh, by NIA. But it's not just US funding. I mean, you'll see on here that uh, um, the German government, uh, also the NHMRC in Australia, 
and the IOCDF, uh, the grant to Odile on, on, uh, and her colleagues on task-based fMRI uh, from various sources around the world. And so uh, do, do feel free if you're interested in writing uh, a proposal to reach out to us and we'll help you uh, with various materials. Um, these are the new grants awarded this year. Uh, congrats to everyone listed here, uh, Dr. Salman and Herting and, and, and Dr. Chen on the Environment Grant. Uh, a great uh, effort that supports resting state and PTSD to Raj Mori and Leon Schmal, um, a grant to the Bipolar Group, congrats to Chris Ching and Alan Andreessen. Um, and also, as we mentioned, uh, efforts in Tourette are now funded by the NMH. Um, a new pediatric TBIR one was awarded to Emily Dennis uh, and, and, and Lisa Wilde. And also Boris Gutman uh, received a Michael J. Fox Foundation grant to study the evolution of Parkinson's disease uh, biomarkers. And, and then also there's a new effort uh, to investigate um, early brain development in children born to depressed uh, mothers in high and low income settings. Um, and and uh, congrats to Minka Grinewald and Jonathan Ipsa uh, working with uh, Rebecca Nick Meyer's uh, Origins Group uh, to do that. These are the planned grants. And again, if you'd like to submit one for a working group or a project, we're very happy to help. We can give you templates of grants that uh, were, were successful in the past. Um, an eighth percentile score was awarded to the uh, CNB 22Q group uh, led by uh, Kerry Bearden and Seb Jackmont, Ida Sonderby and many others. Um, there's a grant uh, on OCD uh, that's been submitted, uh, will be reviewed in, Feb in, in, in February. Uh, Dr. Neda Jahanshad and her team put in a grant to look at white matter across Enigma. Uh, Hugh Garavan, Scott Mackey, Patricia Conrad have submitted a renewal for Enigma addiction. And then there are a number of others uh, that are planned on schizophrenia and schizotypy, uh, an effort to collect data in Pakistan, which is led by Maheen Adamson, uh, pilot data being collected now. And then also new uh, Parkinson's grants on vascular aspects of PD, uh, led by Sarah Al-Bashari, and the informatics of PD, led by uh, Nadeja Hanshad, JB Pauline, uh, and colleagues. And then finally, the Milken Foundation uh, has just received uh, actually rather large number of grants from us. Uh, to support efforts uh, looking at medication effects in bipolar. Quick survey of publications. Uh, as I mentioned, there's rather a lot, so I will not li list them all, but uh, to all of you who contributed, uh, huge congratulations. This is uh, uh, the complete list. And thanks to Sophia for adding the link. So if you're interested in getting a sort of go-to list of publications from Enigma with links, I mean, they're all uh, listed in here. Um, in addition to these 39 from the different working groups that you see uh, listed, again, uh, congrats to everyone who, who's published these. There was also a special issue of human brain mapping. So thanks to Gary Egan, who was willing to entertain the idea of an Enigma special issue uh, with 32 papers. Many of these review the goals and achievements of the different working groups, and it's uh, uh, a wonderful thing to read through. If you click the link at the bottom, there's a, um, a link to uh, the whole thing, all open access, which is, is, is terrific. So the next 15 minutes, uh, and we're, we're kind of on time, the next 15 minutes is going to be a little bit of a survey of methods used across Enigma. So we wanted to tell you about eight novel methods that could be valuable uh, across many uh, working groups. Um, here's just a picture of the methods and workflows that have been developed. And, and big thank you to all of you who support uh, these methods that are applied across many, many uh, clinical working groups. If you look at the top right, uh, there are structural um, analyses based on primarily uh, free surfer. And now that there are subnuclear partitioning tools for the hippocampus, amygdala, and thalamus, uh, there are dockers and, and uh, software that you can all use. I'll tell you about those in a moment. Uh, the ataxia group of Enigma has developed some wonderful tools for analyzing the cerebellum and spinal cord, which I'll tell you about. There's been some advances in analysis of vertex-wise uh, surface-based data uh, that we'll tell you about. Uh, some workflows that assist with voxel-based morphometry, including um, Enigma's VBM tool and CAT12. And then also we'll spend a little time in a moment on uh, the analysis of functional uh, MRI, and we'll sp spend a little time going into detail. There are also 10 uh, clinical working groups that have been looking at structural covariance analysis uh, and three looking at local gyrification indices. And then if you look over there on the right, there's a number of groups looking at brain age and, and normative modeling. Um, if you see someone named there uh, th that's working on these, I mean, please do reach out to the other people. We've, we've noted their names so that you can connect with others who are working on similar projects. Um, we could certainly form an interest group uh, to compare findings across disorders for these methods. Um, I know Jonathan Ortino, uh, Scott Mackey, and Hugh Garavan 
are interested in coordinating a structural covariance uh, interest group. So that that uh, is is likely to be of great value comparing uh, results. So just to turn to uh, functional MRI and in particular resting state fMRI, the group uh, at Charité in Berlin and also uh, Ilya Veer in Nijmegen now um, have developed a workflow known as Halfpipe, which they've published. And this is being used uh, in a huge number of Enigma's working groups to assess functional brain synchrony and how it's altered uh, in different disorders. Now, this was a major effort uh, to get this going across so many working groups. You'll see the contacts in each uh, group uh, listed here. A couple of the manuscripts at the top, uh, William Boone and uh, uh, Vicky Della Perry, uh, uh, finishing manuscripts. Uh, Raj Mori and Mark Logue's PTSD group has 16 projects going on on resting state fMRI. And uh, some are in the planning stage. So if, if you want to reach out to colleagues here on how they've managed to conduct their resting state analyses, there's many uh, people that you can consult for, for advice. Just a word about Halfpipe. It's a processing pipeline um, that is Docker or Singularity based, which you can install and is based on fMRI prep, the Stanford uh, processing stream. It also comes with first and second level analysis options, and you can uh, obtain it at the GitHub link down there at the, at the bottom. There's a manual, uh, all, all sorts of documentation, uh, and also in the paper that you'll see uh, linked, uh, the, there are diagrams of all the options that it provides for resting state analysis. So a huge uh, thank you to the folks uh, at the top, uh, Henrik Walter, Leah Waller, Ilya Veer, and Suzanne Erk for uh, creating and supporting uh, this workflow. This is a list of resources. Um, do subscribe to the mailing list to be notif notified about important updates. There are manuals to have a look at uh, for resting state, task-based fMRI, and also quality control, and then a link that you see there to the paper. One of the things that we'll do periodically is have uh, coming together of all of the groups that are doing resting state functional MRI analysis in Enigma. If you uh, were unable to join the uh, call in, in November, uh, please do consult the uh, minute slides or recording because you'll see really a very nice update of what all the clinical groups are doing with resting state fMRI. And it's really valuable to sort of compare notes and understand uh, what uh, findings uh, could be related uh, potentially later on. So just to sort of summarize the magnitude of this, uh, this is Ele Elena Pozzi's uh, ongoing resting state analysis in MDD uh, with 31 sites of, 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 of which uh, 20 have finished. Um, if, if you look at this paper, this is a wonderful roadmap paper by Willem Ruin and uh, Odile Vandenhovel and the uh, Dan Stein and the OCD working group, where if you want to have a quick look at a roadmap of how to run a uh, half pipe on a disorder, um, they've, they've done all sorts of interesting analyses of ALF, REHO, connectivity data, including how to handle covariates and how they split uh, the design to look at different uh, partitions uh, of the data. Um, they also include some machine learning uh, analyses. And this, this slide we borrowed from, uh, thank you to uh, Lawrence van der Mortel, who presented this uh, on the Tourette syndrome uh, working group call recently as a sort of a guidebook as to how you could do resting state analysis uh, in this study looking at. Another set of methods has to do with analyzing the cerebellum. So um, Ian Harding and colleagues uh, who lead the Enigma Ataxia working group um, developed a workflow for parcellation and voxel-based mapping of cerebellar data. So if you look at this paper, this is actually not from this year, it's from August 2021. Um, Ian and colleagues mapped cerebellar abnormalities in Friedrich ataxia and found that they were greater with a younger age of on onset, a longer duration of illness, and you can see them all paneled out in the picture. Um, these are the effect size in a, in a voxel-based uh, format. And then this led to a pipeline that was used um, in a huge number of working groups. So 16 working groups are running cerebellar analyses. Um, the, the top three uh, are available if you want to look at them. Uh, Rebecca Carestes and Ashley Huggins have uh, papers that are pre-printed that I'll show you in a minute. And then a number of other groups processing cerebellar data. So this could become a really major effort in Enigma um, if there's sufficient harmony across the groups used, uh, we'll be able to make lifespan charts and genetic analyses uh, uh, later on of the cerebellar data. Just to give you a, a quick preview, uh, Rebecca Caristi's paper, uh, she was lead author with Enigma Epilepsy on a paper that showed lower regional uh, gray matter volumes in the cerebellum uh, with small to medium effect sizes um, that were greater um, with earlier ages of, of seizure onset uh, or with longer duration of illness uh, with a regional anatomic uh, profile. Uh, as you can see, 22 sites participated, and there's uh, a, tr a tremendous 
uh, value to, to putting all of this data together. Uh, Ashley Huggins and Raj Mori, also supported by uh, Rebecca and Ian, uh, found um, in a vast cohort of individuals uh, with, with PTSD um, that there were smaller volumes in the posterior cere cerebellum. Um, they, in all of these methodological observations, are very valuable. They found that looking at symptom severity rather than categorical measures of diagnosis um, resulted in a better sensitivity to the effects of, of, of the disorder. And their preprint there at the bottom uh, is available for you to consult if you uh, want to have a go at doing this. Uh, Finian Kelleher and Emily Dennis uh, in Utah uh, conducted a cerebellum analysis with the same uh, pipeline. It's also known as Acapulco. Um, to identify in pediatric uh, mild to severe uh, traumatic brain injury, that uh, that group had smaller volumes of the cerebellum overall and also regions of the vermis and posterior lobe with really quite strong effect sizes, 0.2 to 0.4. And this was primarily uh, driven uh, by chronically affected uh, patients. So you can see a, a rather impressive assembly of different maps of cerebellar cartography associated with different uh, disorders. Uh, also, with the help of Kathy Lawrence, there's a new project launched in the um, Autism Spectrum Disorder Working Group uh, with an estimated 55 sites and over 4,000 individuals, and also in uh, Enigma ADHD, uh, to look at not only the effects of the disorders themselves, but also across disorder comparisons. And this has been assisted by uh, Dr. Carrie, uh, Kathy Lawrence here at, uh, at USC. This toolbox um, is remarkable. In fact, if you look at the um, correlation plots on the top right, it would be difficult to get better behavioral um, uh, and anatomic correlations. There's um, R values of 0.4, which are extraordinary. In this case, between spinal uh, uh, cord area and disease severity in Friedrich's ataxia. So this is a workflow that's also being tried in Parkinson's disease. If you have data that includes um, the spine, uh, or at least the C1, C2 uh, level of the spine, um, and, and an interest in your disorder of looking at uh, these measures, particularly infectious disease or degenerative disease, um, you're welcome to try uh, it out. And then I, I think we're going to pass the microphone to Dr. Sophia Frangu for, for five minutes. Is, is Sophia on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Wonderful. Do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Centile Brain? Th thanks so much, Sophia. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll try and be brief and very concise as you have been. So Centile Brain is an initiative from the Enigma Lifespan Working Group. Um, and the it's available as a web-based uh, tool. Um, and you can see the web address there. And it's a platform for estimating normative deviation expressed both in centiles and Z scores in neuroimaging features uh, using multipartial polynomial regression. We have come to, we have, we present a pre trained model for people to apply to their own data as well as um, easy to use scripts for people that want to develop their own normative modeling. And it's also supported by very extensive comparative evaluation between different um, algorithms that are currently used for normative modeling and other parameters that can actually influence the, um, the accuracy of the models. So in the next slide, you will see some of these parameters that I mentioned. So the, the slide at the top left um, it shows the effect on sample size and model accuracy. Um, so each of these lines, um, I, again, as an example, I, I'm using subcortical volumes, and each of these lines um, represents one uh, subcortical region. And you can see the mean uh, um, absolute error and the RMSE, which are two measures of predictive accuracy, and how they appear to stabilize, to get saturated at about 1,000, 3,000 people. But for samples that are smaller than that, the, um, the accuracy is really questionable and varies quite significantly. The slide on the right shows the comparative performance of some of the, the top four algorithms that are being used in different studies. That includes hierarchical Bayesian regression, uh, Gaussian process uh, regression, GAMLESS, warped Bayesian linear regression, and our preference, which is the multivariate fractional polynomial regression. And again, you can see 
how model accuracy seems to be much better with the, the algorithm that we used. And the model performance across these parameters, it's actually stable across age groups. And this is what you see in the top bottom left-hand side image. Um, um, again, we, we're using subcortical volume measures as an example, but we show the stability of the performance across different age groups. The next one shows um, one aspect of Centile Brain, which is the user interface. One of the most important features of this program is um, that it does not require any computational skills or any sophisticated computational requirement. Uh, using this interface the, the, um, and downloading a, a template that we are providing, any user can populate the template and upload it to the website to create sex specific um, data in terms of Z scores, centile brains, um, uh, centiles. It also gives you the output, also gives you the MAU of your uh, specific model so that you can decide whether it's acceptable to you or not. Um, and also the predicted volumes or uh, other cortical uh, measures that you have submitted. A very important aspect of this, in addition to the fact that it's extremely easy and all you need to know is how to populate an Excel spreadsheet, is that it does not require data transfer. So the data is not being transferred anywhere. The, the algorithm set, and then you can download them at your computer. We have no idea. We, we don't keep copies of the data. We don't even see what actually happens on the website. It's all done at your site so there is no issues with ethics and so on and again the final slide of that we're going to yes um, <clears throat> is a, a very very brief outline of the current projects and planned projects so um, there's the central brain has already been applied to clinical high-risk individuals in collaboration with the clinical high-risk and psychosis working group an abstract was presented at the SCNP. The lead author here is Solila Haas, and the paper is very, very close to submission. We have made, um, uh, we hope, before the end of the year. Um, the same algorithm that we described here has also been applied to DTI, and there is a pilot paper uh, by Julio Villarón. And we also have planned projects to look at the generalizability of the model that we have developed for structural MRI in centile brain to non-European ancestry groups, estimate the effect of socioeconomic status, childhood at rest in IQ on the normative values of SMRI features again. And of course, um, in collaboration with Ian Hardy to see if we can have a normative modeling across the lifespan for cerebral subregions and we hope, with your assistance, to use Central Brain uh, eventually as a kind of platform for individualized measures um, of brain organization. And so we will be launching a project uh, hoping to use exactly the same groups as Central Brain to look at network-based brain age that actually can give you age per functional network that may be a little bit more mechanistically tractable than global brain age that we usually get. Thank you, and I hope I kept to five minutes. You sure did. Thank, thank, thanks so much, Sophia, and <clears throat> huge congratulations to your team, including Rianne Guy and, and, and others who've developed this. So I understand that Centile Brain is sort of in beta, so if folks want to try it and give some feedback to uh, Professor Frango and her team, that would be Terrific. And do, do look out for a manuscript. There are 88 cohorts uh, contributing data to that. So if you haven't received it, you will uh, very soon. Everybody has received it by now. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Sophia. So mo mo moving on. So another method that might find uh, a lot of interest across Enigma um, is looking at voxel-based morphometry. So Matthew Kempton and Anthony James uh, have developed an Enigma VBM uh, toolkit based on the Dartel uh, protocol. Uh, six groups in Enigma are running it. So you'll see an OCD, bipolar, uh, PTSD, early onset psychosis, uh, autism, and Parkinson's. Uh, the protagonists of those analyses are listed there. 
Uh, and then there's also CAT-12. So this is a, a, a version of a voxel-based mapping tool that was uh, written by Christian Gasser uh, at the University of Vienna. Um, it also provides many other volumetric and surface-based uh, uh, metrics. And this is being uh, run by uh, the Addiction and Schizotypy Working Groups and many others. So the reason we've listed the names of the leads is uh, please do feel free to reach out um, to others if you have um, your interest in either collaborating or helping each other uh, troubleshoot. So th thanks to Matthew and, and Christian for uh, supporting those analyses. There's been three interesting developments in surface-based shape analysis. So just to remind you, uh, Dr. Boris Goodman uh, developed a streamlined toolkit for 3D surface-based analysis of deep surface morphometry, and the link uh, to it is there. In an extension, uh, Vladimir Bilov and, and Roberto Goya Maldonado uh, and colleagues in the MDD working group uh, have a deep learning method, which you see illustrated in the middle. So if you can imagine all the attributes on the surface can be uh, flattened down using a variety of projective uh, techniques. And these become images with uh, a wealth of predictive information in, and then they fed those into uh, both classical machine learning methods like support vector machines or deep learning methods uh, such as convolutional neural networks, uh, in their case to um, understand uh, effects of, of MDD, but also it could be used in other groups uh, to map uh, prognostic features and so forth. Um, there are also new tools um, developed by Boris Goodman's group for staging of disease here applied in a Mackay paper to Parkinson's disease. But you can imagine how valuable it might be uh, if a patient's scan were mapped, and then you could uh, stage or even subtype uh, their the disorder uh, using these te uh, techniques. Another development uh, is the subcortical structure analyses have gone uh, to finer scale using a variety of uh, packages for subnuclear parcellation of the thalamus, amygdala, and hippocampus. And again, uh, you'll see some methods papers by uh, Philip Seyman and Artemis Valiangos Petropoulou um, illustrating how these work, uh, not just in uh, healthy individuals, but in, in populations with stroke where there might be lesions that would interfere with the correct segmentation of different structures. And you'll see um, the OCD working group has prepared uh, Docker containers uh, for some of these methods, uh, and you'll see papers uh, talking about their oh. use, uh, use there. Okay, so let's. Uh... Sorry, it's my Alexa dot reminding me to do something. Uh, so, <laughs> so moving on to, to Brain Age. Now, there is a Brain Age working group that's led by uh, James Cole uh, at King's College London. Um, with his help, we made a census of the methods that are being used um, to uh, compute Brain Age. Just to remind anyone who doesn't know, this is a method to estimate the age of a person based on the MRI scan. And uh, in doing so, I mean, a variety of algorithms are available to do it. Um, you can test whether a disorder is associated with apparently accelerated or delayed uh, development or aging. Um, the methods used in Enigma are listed here. So you'll see Photon. Um, there's a site that's uh, run by Tim Hahn uh, that uh, Laura Hahn and Leanne Schmal have uh, developed and benchmarked a method uh, to, to compute brain age from uh, regional anatomic measures. Uh, brain age R, uh, which uses the raw T1-weighted uh, MRI, uh, is a software toolkit developed by James Cole and his team that's available at the GitHub there. And then there's a variety of other techniques that are very uh, clever. Uh, there's an EEG-based brain age method and a resting state fMRI-based uh, method, and also alternate techniques, uh, Barakas and, and Tobias Kaufman's model, uh, which uh, groups are, are finding. So do, uh, if you're leading a brain age project, let uh, James Cole know, and we can all learn from each other's uh, experiences. Just to encourage folks to try out the Enigma brain age model, uh, which is hosted at Tim Hahn's Photon AI site, um, Laura Hahn and colleagues have found that uh, major depression is associated with uh, mildly accelerated brain aging, and they're now even linking polygenic risk scores for MDD uh, to the degree of accelerated aging uh, that's evident. Now, nice thing about this site is you can just upload data and have the brain ages uh, computed for you. Other projects going on. Um, this, this is, uh, um, well, as you can see here, the validation study that uh, Laura Hahn has done uh, of that tool uh, in a number of new cohorts uh, uh, as, uh, assessed for MDD. Um, there's a wonderful um, paper by uh, Costas Constantinides uh, and Esther Walton and the Schizophrenia Working Group showing that there's about a three and a half year acceleration of, of, a, of apparent brain aging. And look at the forest plot. I mean, this is tremendously convincing data. Nearly every cohort around the world uh, showed 
um, signs of increased uh, brain age uh, in, in, in schizophrenia. So congrats to them. I think that paper came out on the 9th of December, so just, just a couple of weeks ago. Also, Ashley Clausen uh, and, and Raj Mori and the Enigma PGC PTSD uh, working group have looked at interactions between brain age and PTSD, showing that uh, with greater duration of PTSD, uh, at least in men, perhaps less so in women, uh, there's an acceleration of aging uh, that, that you would see as indexed by uh, brain age. Another important topic is harmonization. So if you run these workflows on data from around the world, there's a certain amount of interest in, in harmonizing and making comparable the computed measures from each cohort. Uh, this paper on the left by uh, Liz Haddad, who's in Neda Jahanshah's uh, lab here at USC, assessed how reliable it is to use different versions of the common uh, morphometry software, uh, FreeSurfer, which as you know, has been through several uh, incarnations. Um, she has tremendously useful data. You, your reviewers will often ask you, um, does it matter if the cohorts used a different version of uh, FreeSurfer to process the, the MRIs? And she has complete details uh, on that in her paper now in human brain mapping. And then also Dylan Sun working with Raj Mori uh, compared uh, the harmonization methods COMBAT and, and an uh, advanced version of it COMBAT GAM um, for harmonizing and in a sense chaining together um, observations from MRI from cohorts that span different parts of the lifespan. And so they, uh, the summary is they recommend using COMBAT GAM uh, if your data spans uh, a large fraction of the lifespan. But you'll see a very interesting and in-depth analysis of the values of those tools versus uh, simple uh, linear mixed models, which also are being used uh, in Enigma. This is a monumental uh, overview by Johanna Bayer and Philip Seyman uh, on correcting for site effects in multi-site neuroimaging. And so if you're combining data from multiple cohorts around the world, uh, there has to be some uh, principle uh, that's used to combine them. And you'll see them review not just COMBAT, but also COVBAT, normative modeling, and a, an approach known as neuroharmony. And even as you see at the top uh, right there, these deep learning methods, one of them by Mengting Liu and Neda Jahanshad, others by um, uh, Dan Moya and others, that use generative adversarial networks, a type of deep learning method, to adjust scans from each center to appear as though they were collected uh, somewhere else. So if, if this bewildering variety uh, is too much uh, to read, they've, they've digested this excellent summary uh, link there at the bottom that you can uh, re read over Christmas if there's nothing else to do. Finally, now this isn't a method. It, it, it's an, it, an emerging clinical th theme in all of, many of the Enigma working groups that has to do with medication and treatment. And the reason I want to bring it up is that in many working groups, you'll see, here's a study of OCD by uh, Fabrizio and Federica Piras and, and Gianfranco Spalletta, where they had found that the observed abnormality in diffusion MRI in the brain's white matter microstructure uh, depends on, on three things. It depends on how long you've been ill. Uh, it depends on the age of onset of OCD. But also it depends on the fraction of the cohort that is medicated. And so this is a really interesting observation with barely any difference whatsoever found uh, in unmedicated individuals with OCD. Um, but in, in those cohorts that had a large fraction of patients medicated, they found profound uh, differences. And just to support the case a little more, um, Professor Chao Ganyan of the Direct Consortium is working with uh, Leanne Schmal and colleagues in Enigma MDD. And they had found in an absolutely vast voxel-based, uh, surface-based analysis of the cortex, that there were greater uh, profiles of cortical thinning, uh, not just in people with MDD who had been ill longer uh, and, and, or had metabolic disorders such as diabetes, but also the results were strongly associated with whether or not you were taking antidepressants. Now, before anyone says that the medication is causing a problem, I mean, there's a confound here. So if the, if the trials are not randomized, the people receiving the most medications uh, or for the longest time tend to be the most severely ill. So in an attempt to do a good job of looking at this, um, there are efforts uh, publishing treatment, uh, studying treatment response uh, here in OCD, uh, led by uh, Sarah Batolin and, and, and Carlos Soriano Mas, who just published a wonderful paper on CBT response in OCD, a new project predicting treatment response from resting state fMRI by Guido van Wingen and Lawrence van der Mortel. Um, and then a, a constellation of grants uh, led by uh, Chris Ching uh, involving the people you see uh, who they're, they're tabulating medication according to the so-called neuroscience-based nomenclature, which tries to distinguish mode of action in the brain. And then after doing so, they're trying to link 
for example, the effects uh, in bipolar disorder of lithium and anti-epileptics uh, to different uh, trajectories uh, of, of brain uh, features. And so uh, this is obviously going to be a really exciting uh, area of work now that the neuromodulation uh, and several TMS groups uh, are, are underway. Okay, quick update on diffusion MRI. Uh, we have about 17 minutes until I will stop talking. So this is, we're about on track. Quick update on uh, seven different projects using diffusion imaging. So Dr. Emily Dennis and, and Dr. Lisa Wild uh, led a project in uh, military uh, traumatic brain injury, also with David Tate, I don't want to forget David there, um, in which they found that not only was microstructure altered, but the degree of laterality, the asymmetry uh, was also altered here in, in the cingulum. Uh, which will then become an important biomarker for them to assess uh, in relation to prognosis. Claudia Barth and Ingrid Agouch, uh, working in early onset psychosis, uh, evaluated, and also Sinead Kelly, evaluated microstructure in, in uh, people with psychosis of very early onset, finding some resemblance with idiopathic adult schizophrenia, and also quite an in-depth analysis of whether or not meta or mega analysis, uh, number one, found the same results, and number two, was more sensitive to the effect of psychosis. So we do, do have a look at their paper that was published uh, last Monday on the 12th of December. The other work in neurodevelopment, this is work led by uh, Kathy Lawrence uh, in, in the uh, Autism Spectrum Disorder Working Group and, and also in ADHD, uh, assembling data to run through the Enigma workflows. Uh, here looking at uh, traditional metrics, uh, here you see Kathy presenting at INSAR. Um, and there's been tremendous pro progress uh, in these efforts, finding signatures in, in uh, autism spectrum disorder that were, I think, not previously suspected. In Parkinson's disease, this project led by Connor owens Walton and Neda Jahanshad and their colleagues, Max Lansma and, and Eva van Hees with Isbrand van der Werf, they've looked at 16 cohorts of individuals with Parkinson's disease and compared white matter microstructure with healthy controls. Now to first order, you will see, uh, as in any degenerative disease, lower FA and higher mean diffusivity uh, in the patients. In fact, you can see for all the regions they examined, or nearly all of them, uh, FA was lower. But there's a very interesting pattern emerging. Although the, as, as Parkinson's disease progresses and there's a staging system, the Hohn and Yar staging system with five stages, although the deficits increase with increasing uh, disease burden, there's a very unusual situation uh, in stage one of Parkinson's disease. And I, I refer you to the maps on the top left. That shows higher FA uh, in people with stage one Parkinson's uh, relative to uh, people uh, that are typical uh, for, for that age and lower MD. But by the time on the bottom row, by the time the patients are at stage two, which is a little more severe in terms of motor impairment, the, the, the abnormalities go the usual way. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is just to give a salutary, salutary note for anyone doing machine learning. <laughs> so if you are trying to understand profiles associated with disease severity, uh, you have to be aware of these stage-specific uh, abnormalities. Another area of endeavor that uh, Sophia Franku pointed to with the centile brain system is normative modeling. And so uh, Shalala Haas and others have been looking at scoring brain metrics for abnormality using a so-called Bayesian uh, reference model for the normal trajectories uh, for the, these structures. This paper by Julio Villalon um, was presented at Mikai, it also won an award at ISRM's uh, diffusion work workshop. And it explains a method to um, combine data into a hierarchical Bayesian model, which then can be used uh, to write out Z scores or abnormality scores uh, for certain disorders here, illustrated in 16p11 uh, uh, deletion syndrome with uh, partnership from members of the Enigma CNV working group. One thing to be aware of is that the detected pattern of deficits or anomalies depends on the order of the model, linear or B-spline. And so this is just something that uh, uh, you could have a look at and be aware of as you do uh, normative modeling uh, in the disorders that you're studying. And then finally, to wrap up DTI, uh, Neda Jahanshad here at USC put in a R01 with Frank Ye, uh, the developer of DSI Studio, uh, and all, all also with Simon Fisher, Barbara Franca, and Sarah Medland. Um, this is a tremendous uh, toolbox to examine uh, fiber tractography in different ways. A complementary approach being developed and, and piloted in Enigma by Bram Chandio, who's a postdoc here at USC, uh, is known as Bundle Analytics. It's part of the DiPi framework for tractography, and so that's being uh, tested in a few different uh, working groups. 
And then also a method by Shruti Gadawa, who's, who's working with uh, Neda Jahanshad uh, here at USC for deep learning-based automatic segmentation of the corpus callosum. So if you're, if you're interested in segmenting the corpus callosum, which a free surfer doesn't always uh, do, do fully, um, do reach out to, to uh, Dr. Jahanshad and, and, and to Shruti uh, to have a go at that method. They are also leading, uh, with Barbara Maltz and many others listed uh, there, uh, a genome-wide association study of diffusion microstructure uh, measures. Um, and there's a significant effort as part of that GWAS to make lifespan charts and harmonization methods uh, being led by Alyssa Zhu and uh, um, Julio Villalan and Talia Nier. So just a quick update on genetic studies. So there's 12, 12 minutes to go. I'll tell you a little bit uh, about uh, the genetics working group, uh, ably led as always by Sarah Medland uh, in, in, in Brisbane. Um, this study came out uh, in April of this year in Nature Neuroscience, led by uh, Rachel Brower and Hilke Holzhoff-Paul, um, and a vast a range of people across the world who'd been scanning uh, people with MRI longitudinally. So you could ask the question, if I measure the degree of brain change between uh, a pair of scans acquired longitudinally, are there any markers in the genome where there's common variants uh, that are linked with the degree of either development uh, or brain tissue loss? And they found uh, 15 genomic loci where the variants, uh, common variants are associated with the speed of brain development and, and aging as measured by uh, those longitudinal uh, uh, assessments. If you can see it on the far right, there's a forest plot. And so that's one of the variants in the genome that across all of those cohorts, I think there's a huge number of cohorts in this, in, in this study, over 10,000 people, are fairly convincing in their degree of association uh, and the direction of association with the rates of brain aging. So uh, congrats to Rachel Brower and all, all of you who were uh, participating in that uh, study. There is a, a genome-wide association study to find common genetic uh, variants associated with brain age. Uh, um, if, if you're interested, they're still accepting data. So fill out the form. Uh, 46 cohorts uh, totaling uh, 25,000 people uh, have already signed up. Uh, some of them are pending or in, in, in the works. Um, uh, if, if you're interested in, in joining, do reach out to Vilta Baltramai Tita or, or Esther Walton or Danai Dima. Uh, I hope I didn't butcher your splendid Lithuanian name, Vilta. <laughs> but I, if you um, want, want to join in with this, uh, do, do reach out to them. And this is just a status of the first 17 cohorts participating in the brain age uh, GWAS. Now, this, this is a phenomenal study uh, that was, was led and is nearly finished uh, by Luis Garcia Marin, uh, Adrian Campos, um, uh, Sarah Medland, uh, and, and um, uh, Miguel Renteria, um, examining the genetic architecture of, of uh, subcortical regional volumes and ICV. They have found, uh, by pooling data across Enigma, the Charge Consortium, UK Biobank, and a separate held out cohort uh, of a ABCD, over 500 independent loci that are associated with uh, the volumes of these subcortical structures, um, implicating many interesting genes. I mean, many of you will see genes like uh, MAP-T, which have very, very interesting functions, and significant genetic overlap between the genetic determinants of, of regional brain volume and a range of psychiatric uh, conditions, Parkinson's, anorexia, uh, even insomnia. You will receive a, a, a Google Doc manuscript in mid-January uh, to, to have a look at. I mean, this has been an absolutely phenomenal uh, study. Now, I, I did tell you there'd be a mind-blowing result. So he, here is a mind-blowing result uh, from, from this paper. They were able to compute a polygenic risk score uh, from this brain GWAS that was able to explain 10% of the variance in intracranial volume. And it was also able to explain 7% of the variance in putamen volume or 6% for the chordate and brainstem and 5% of the hippocampal volume. Now, in a sense, Enigma has been going for 13 years. I mean, this absolutely vindicates uh, the value of imaging genetics uh, for studying the brain because this was uh, done in independent data, not used in the discovery GWAS. It was actually done in ABCD where they're primarily, well, they're all children, nine-year-old children for the most part. So this is the most difficult uh, scenario to replicate um, genetic association where the, the age uh, and even the, the ancestral composition of that sample is very diverse. There is some work to do. So you'll see that the polygenic risk score uh, fraction of variance explained in brain structure is to some degree lower for the most part in people of non-European ancestry 
uh, particularly African and Asian ancestry. But again, this is tremendously interesting. And for those of you collecting uh, genetic data on cohorts of more diverse ancestry, um, I mean, this is going to be a tremendous project uh, to be involved with as well. You could imagine computing the shifts in the lifespan charts uh, to see when uh, during life uh, these uh, genomic loci exert their effects. So congrats uh, to the team there for, for this uh, mind-blowing result. There's also ongoing um, 100 cohorts have signed up so far for an analysis of um, white matter microstructure using diffusion MRI, uh, totaling over 50,000 people. If you'd like to join in, just fill out the survey. So the link there, um, if you can't click on it, uh, we'll circulate the slides afterwards and all these links will be hot links that you can uh, join in with. Uh, and this, this project by Barbara Maltz, uh, Gabriela Blockland, uh, Nina roth Mota, uh, and, and members of Neda Jahanshad's lab uh, is, is, is well underway. Now this one uh, is nearly finished. And so a study of the genetic uh, architecture of the uh, cerebellum uh, has been done by Ian Harding's group and Sarah Medlin's group um, in, in which uh, if you have genome-wide genetic data and the ability to measure the cerebellum in your images, um, you can take part, uh, you can download the uh, protocol for the genetics on the left and for the MRI on the right. Um, and again, if, if, if you have sequence data, whole genome sequences or exome sequences, uh, do let uh, Sarah and Ian know because there's some additional rare variant analyses that are planned. Uh, the data freeze will happen mid-January uh, and uh, there's an intent obviously to put a paper together shortly after. Now this, this is a remarkable study. So, so Dirk Smith, and uh, Philip Jawinski have been studying uh, EEG measures uh, such as oscillatory power, theta-beta ratio, and functional connectivity, and also other more advanced metrics of oscillation dynamics. Now, you'll remember that they published a rather remarkable study of EEG in which the genetic loci that influence it, or at least uh, functional synchrony in the brain, were also implicated in alcoholism, epilepsy, particularly the uh, GABA2 uh, subunit of the GABA receptor. So there's a very interesting link between um, inhibitory neurotransmission, epilepsy, and alcoholism, in which they're strongly implicated, and also EEG uh, phenotypes. Um, this this uh, is uh, well underway. Uh, they're doing a second round of their EEG analysis. And thank you, of course, to both Dirk and Philippe and all the cohorts who've become uh, involved with that over the years. That also has involved a great deal of work on harmonization and norming. Uh, of data across the lifespan. There is also, led by the Charité group, um, a task-based fMRI GWAS, focusing initially on tasks for three uh, types of, of, of stimulus uh, involving faces, reward, and working memory. Um, it's still accepting data, so if you're interested, uh, do contact uh, Henrik, Leia, and, and, and colleagues, um, and you'll see a tabulation of the um, status of that project uh, here. Now, this is remarkable. The, the um, Enigma CNV group um, has been analyzing penetrance scores. In other words, the degree of influence of CNVs across the genome, copy number variants, uh, on various uh, psychiatric and developmental uh, outcomes, including psychosis and developmental delay. And they, they've been finding in, the, in this absolutely remarkable analysis across many, many sites um, that the degree uh, of effect on the brain uh, for these various CNVs in different categories um, is depending on their penetrance, their degree of influence on uh, or risk for uh, schizophrenia and other disorders. So this is part of a long-term project to look at a variety of modalities and, and really make sense of the coherent patterns of different types of CNVs uh, across the world. Epigenetics, uh, Dr. Sylvain de Rivière from K KCL uh, has added a vast data set also from KCL, um, headed up by David Edwards called Developing Human Connectome Project. Uh, this link was uh, identified by Rebecca Nickmayer in the origins group, and then we all got together to see how that data could be put together. And this will greatly enhance the uh, ability to discover loci in the genome where methylation uh, is linked with brain uh, trajectories. Some clinical working group updates. Oh, I kind of, I kind of forgot the time, didn't I? Okay, well, we'll spend a little bit, uh, little bit of time on, on these. So the OD, OCD working group led by Odil van den Hovel and Dan Stein uh, consists of 50 worldwide samples, and they published four papers uh, this year that you can see uh, listed here. Um, tremendous range of, of, of sites involved with this. You can see the projects that they're doing, uh, the approaches that have been used and the ones that are now being tested. 
uh, and the manuscripts in preparation from voxel based to deep learning methods to cerebellar methods and and, and many more so again congrats uh, to all the members of the group uh, uh, doing these a grant was submitted linking enigma ocd with the so-called global ocd consortium which is a set of sites that are prospectively collecting data together um, from all of these cities they look like rather wonderful places to visit um, and and so that in a sense is trying to understand whether prospective harmonization of data collection uh, is helpful uh, versus uh, uh, retrospective. Enigma Bipolar <coughs> has 18 uh, ongoing projects. This is led by uh, Chris Ching and Owen Andreasen. You'll see a roadmap on the bottom right of the various activities that they're pursuing and, and the, the methods used. Um, and then also the addiction group. This is an incredible group led by Scott Mackey, Hugh Garavan, Patricia Conrad. Huge number of completed projects in all data modalities. Um, many of their analyses, as you know, are, are um, stratified by substance used, uh, looking at alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, nicotine, you know, many, many other features that you'll see uh, there listed on, on, on the right. So if you're interested, please do reach out to Scott, you and Patricia uh, to join. They have a fantastic number of ongoing, ongoing projects. And just to highlight one, uh, Jipeng uh, Sao um, published analysis with Hugh Garavan and others in the addiction group showing that the first principal component of cortical thickness, the sort of essence of variation in, in the brain, uh, was linked with a wide range of psychiatric disorders and also with aging. Uh, and its profile in the brain was also enriched for certain types of genes expressed during development. So do have a look at their paper, um, which begins to unify some of the observations uh, across the different uh, psychiatric uh, conditions. The PTSD group led by Raj Mori and, and Mark Logue uh, has 41 projects ongoing, and this is absolutely remarkable. Um, and again, thank you for um, participating and overseeing this vast range of, of projects that you see listed on the on the left there. Um, just to focus on one, and it's hard to single one out, this analysis, it's a machine learning analysis by Shi Zhu, where um, she combined structural diffusion and resting state data, all coming from the Enigma workflows, and combined those three sources of neuroimaging data uh, to make predictions in PTSD. Um, and that, that preprint uh, is, is now available. One thing that's very nice about this is it offers a roadmap if you'd like one uh, for multimodal machine learning uh, in Enigma and you can follow some of the methods. And that they allow you to say which modalities contribute the most uh, to the task of interest and how much pooling them uh, outperforms the single modalities uh, on their own. Enigma and MDD, uh, led by Leon Schmal and Dick Veltman, uh, has a vast range of projects, 19 projects listed here, including the two uh, new ones focusing on, 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 TM on TMS. Um, they also have had side calls focusing on machine learning because the range of methods used for subtyping uh, in the group have, have really taken off. And so uh, we're really looking forward to seeing the, uh, the results of many of these. Uh, you will see many uh, manuscripts at the top there are in preparation. Um, just to talk about one in particular, an alliance with a direct consortium led by Chao Gan Yan in, in Beijing uh, has found in, in the largest sample ever um, rather prominent results for cortical thickness uh, in major depression, no results for surface area, but with the thickness differences primarily uh, found in result, adults, not uh, adolescents, and as we said earlier, in, in antidepressant users. So uh, wonderful expansion of, of, of their project. The Schizotypy Working Group, uh, which uh, you, you see here is doing a range of uh, analyses of, of uh, structural covariance, um, multivariate pattern analysis, and, and relationship to item level uh, data. A uh, really wonderful paper by Matthias Kirchner was presented on a recent call, and this group has really taken off uh, and relating their findings to other disorders, as you see there uh, on the uh, bottom uh, left. Uh, they have a number of projects in schizotypy looking at childhood trauma, positive and negative symptoms, uh, and multivariate pattern analysis that you see uh, listed. Esther Walton and Stefan Ehrlich uh, published a landmark study uh, that was reported in the UK Daily Telegraph, among other venues, um, showing that people with um, uh, anorexia nervosa have very uh, substantial differences in neuroanatomy, one standard deviation of shift uh, in these measures. But with some hope that uh, um, renutrition uh, treatment, people that were um, treated and, and, and uh, eating uh, was restored, uh, actually restored uh, even their brain structure. So there's a remarkable paper 
There is also a paper now being prepared by the Bellini Universa um, uh, subgroup uh, and many other projects, as you see listed there, uh, looking at anorexia from the standpoint of DTI, machine learning, uh, and other uh, techniques. Enigma anxiety uh, is in fact an umbrella group. So if you look uh, on the bottom right, there are subgroups focused on social anxiety, specific phobias, panic disorder, generalized anxiety, uh, childhood uh, inhibited, inhibited temperament, and fear conditioning. Um, this is a monumental effort, uh, and thank you to Yana Marie, uh, Ninka, Dan, and Nick for, for spearheading this you know, vast and broad-ranging initiative across the anxiety spectrum. And you will see listed here many of the uh, techniques that, that are being used. We've listed the names of the leads of the analyses, because if you see uh, an analysis that you're doing in another disorder, um, I know that the anxiety group would be more than interested in partnering up with you to uh, compare findings and results. The Antisocial Behavior Working Group, led by Stefan de Brito, Graham Fairchild, uh, and Yidian and Marlena, have 35 research groups uh, joined, uh, five ongoing projects that are on the next slide. And this is the largest neuroimaging data set on youths with, with uh, conduct disorder. Uh, they're looking primarily at case control differences, but also uh, dimensional relationships between conduct disorder uh, and the brain. Uh, there's a, a, a wonderful project led by Sophie Townend um, looking at uh, internalizing and externalizing uh, symptoms, which people looking at those uh, aspects and other disorders are welcome to join in with. And then a new psychopathy project uh, led by Sally Chester uh, that you're welcome to contact them if you're interested in joining in with. Two updates from brain injury. Uh, I feel like we can't do justice to each of these in one minute. Um, but Emily Dennis and her, her colleagues, I think this study is by Eamon Kennedy, um, in the clinical endpoints uh, subgroup, they really developed an approach to so-called crosswalk or equate clinical scores uh, collated with different tests. So now this is a study of verbal learning. And even though there are three scales which uh, typically are used to assess these uh, across these 53 studies, they found a, a you know, re really interesting way and in fact a free online tool to interconvert scores. And so I would recommend when that paper is pre-printed, uh, we all have a look at it because uh, they also found remarkable uh, patterns across languages in verbal learning. Very, very interesting. And then also the MRS subgroup uh, led by Alexander Lynn uh, and, and Brenda Bartnick Olson, uh, with Ashley Harris as lead, uh, just uh, had accepted a paper on harmonization of spectroscopy uh, across the world. Now, this is a new outreach uh, headed up by Carrie Esipenko and Michael Ellis in the IPV or Intimate Partner Violence uh, Working Group. In addition, uh, to their remarkable work with imaging, they've also launched a global knowledge exchange, exchange network in which service providers uh, share their lived experiences and knowledge uh, to accelerate uh, IPV brain injury education and clinical care. So this is a wonderful initiative and th thanks so much uh, uh, to Carrie and Michael for, for initiating this. Enigma HIV had a call last week. Um, they have five projects. There's a subcortical paper just published in JAMA Network Open, uh, led by Talia Nier from Neda Jahanshad's group. They're also looking at um, uh, brain aging, resting state functional connectivity, uh, and network models of, of brain aging and white matter degeneration. Uh, you'll see the leads, Jonathan Ipsa, Elia Ibn Idris, Caitlin Peterson, and Rachel Katzel uh, listed here. So do, do reach out to them if you're interested uh, in HIV-related work. Enigma epilepsy, which has been ably led by Karen McDonald and Sanjay Sisodia, uh, with pipeline developers Adam uh, Donatello, uh, Nihar and Eric, and Micropipe developers Raul and Boris, uh, have been analyzing uh, epilepsy data from across the world. They have two NIH grants uh, that, that now fund them, um, and, and, and well, one of them is under review. And just to sort of single out two papers of great interest, um, Sarah Livier, uh, who you'll know as uh, the lead author of the Enigma Toolbox, along with Boris Bernhard, have been relating structural network alterations uh, with outcomes in focal and generalized epilepsy, and not only looking at the networks, but linking uh, the, the connectomic measures to gene expression uh, and other transcriptomic data that is overlaid, a very interesting uh, model of epicenters and propagation uh, of effects in, in, in epilepsy. And then also, th this method might be of interest to anyone studying a, pro a progressive disease, uh, Simo Lopez and, and Andre Altman have been working with event-based modeling, uh, also with Neil Ox to be in Parkinson's, where if you have a series of stages of a disorder, um, they can reconstruct uh, almost a time-lapse model uh, from the data that will then let you stage 
and subtype patients uh, and make different uh, observations about associations with, uh, with other disease uh, parameters. Um, Adam Shadler and Donatello Arenzo have um, developed a pipeline to centralize the raw imaging data. So this is very useful perhaps to other groups as well. Uh, Raul and Boris have been running this data through Micapipe uh, for, for looking at various uh, metrics. And then also some deep learning work by Eric Kastner and Kerry McDonald and others, um, reading in more scans to convolutional neural networks. And in this case, uh, making a decision regarding the lateralization uh, of seizure onset in epilepsy, a very powerful framework. And we may in the new year have a call across Enigma on deep learning, CNNs and machine learning. I've given it short shrift today, but it's a new direction of great interest. In PD, this work uh, we highlighted a little bit earlier on, three grants now support it. Um, if you were to look at the uh, projects going on in Parkinson's disease, um, there are uh, morphometric uh, diffusion and cerebellar analyses, also work on subtyping and stage inference that we talked about a moment ago, a virtual histology linking the brain maps to uh, connectomics and the transcriptome, and then new efforts looking at uh, white matter lesions uh, and their impact on outcomes and also spinal cord uh, morphology. Uh, in stroke, uh, Lee Liu has been spearheading uh, six papers to date with a number of ongoing projects uh, uh, that you see listed here, um, many of them uh, using connectivity techniques, uh, diffusion, brain age, uh, and, and white matter. So again, if you're looking at those metrics, do feel free to reach out to the folks uh, that are listed there. And then last of all, a call by Enigma CNV for anyone with genomic data, if you want your CNVs called, uh, now they are, after publishing four magnificent papers that focused on certain deletions and duplications that you'll see there in green, they're calling uh, for new cohorts to target a wider range of CNVs, uh, different ways to categorize them, and a broader range of brain uh, measures. They, they've been doing a number of wonderful projects, and you can contact Ida Sandaby uh, and, and Ola Andreasen if you're interested. A little bit of cross-disorder work. Now, we talk about these disorders as if they're all somehow independent, but we know that they're not. And these four papers published this year have highlighted the similarities and differences across different uh, psychiatric and developmental uh, conditions, and not just between the disorders, but the similarities between the brain uh, differences and patterns of uh, gene expression, uh, connectivity, and even neuroreceptor distribution. So I just want to uh, thank Yash Patel and Thomas Paus uh, for the paper there. Uh, on, on the left, a new one on virtual ontogeny, looking at uh, developmental gene expression uh, and future deficits in, in, in the brain in psychiatry. Um, remarkable work by Micah Hetwer and, and, and Sophie Volk, and also by Ji Peng Kao, which I talked about, and Hugh Garavan, uh, looking at common uh, statistical profiles across disorders and how they relate uh, to, to, to uh, other maps. And then finally, work by Bo Young Park and Boris Bernhardt relating all these brain mapping deficits to so-called neural gradients, multi-scale neural gradients, uh, really getting into the system's architecture of, of the disease. And just to pick one, this is, this is a paper, a very nice paper um, on molecular mapping uh, being linked to brain maps. Uh, Justine Hansen and Bratislav Misic uh, have been relating Enigma's brain uh, deficit maps, which you see uh, in, in the middle there, to patterns of receptor distribution. So you'll see interesting links between serotonin uh, transporter uh, distributions, even uh, opiate receptors, uh, and different disorders. So this is the first step, as you can imagine, uh, towards a lookup table that links, um, you know, tomographic neuroscience with imaging uh, to all the vast landscape of uh, of uh, topographic maps that you have from molecular mapping as well. So congrats to Justine and, and, and Bratislav for that, that work. If you'd like to do this, um, in other words, relate your brain maps to molecular cytoarchitecture and gene expression data, uh, this wonderful toolbox by Sarah Larivière and, and uh, Boris Bernhardt uh, and the Enigma Epilepsy Group uh, is available. I mean, you can go and look at the, the documentation. And this will let you when, you, when you finish your brain mapping study, it'll let you relate your findings to all the other um, vast landscape of maps that have been assembled by neuroscientists uh, on molecular and cellular architecture. And there's a few more across disorder projects, a transcriptomic project, uh, with a pipeline developed by Leonardo Soriva and Carolina Capi in OCD, um, one on internalizing and externalizing symptoms led by uh, Sophie Townend and Stefan de Brito. If you're interested in, in those symptom domains, do reach out to them. They're very interested in collecting data across uh, MDD, ADHD, anxiety, 
and, and addiction to relate uh, those to antisocial behavior. And then there's also in the Suicidal Thoughts and Behavior Working Group, uh, Laura Van Velsen is leading an effort uh, on transdiagnostic uh, suicidal thoughts and behavior, uh, which if you're interested in, do reach out uh, to her. And then there's the beginning of a cross-disorder deep learning and machine learning project led by Ling Li Zhang, uh, also supported by Chris Ching, uh, to look at uh, cross-diagnostic deep learning for uh, differential uh, diagnosis. Uh, last um, three minutes, uh, Emily Dennis and Lisa Wild launched Enigma U, which is a free online school. And so similar to Coursera, but aimed at advanced high school and intro college level students, they have nearly 500 students enrolled uh, from 70 countries. Now, the idea of this is to help train uh, new students in um, the design of scientific experiments uh, in neurology and psychiatry, coding, statistics, uh, and really to expand opportunities uh, for students that wouldn't otherwise have access to training. Now, they've had an absolutely terrific uh, response, and there's even a, a GoFundMe if you want to give money. Uh, it costs $9 uh, US dollars to uh, provide these materials to a student for, for six months. And probably you know, more, more importantly for this group, if you're interested in recording materials on clinical disorders uh, for this, then uh, please do reach out to, to Emily. So thanks for all, all the company and, and, and collaboration at, at these events throughout the year. This is Enigma um, events that we had in person. So we're lucky after COVID to meet uh, in New Orleans for SOBP and in Glasgow in Scotland for OHBM. Uh, it's wonderful to get uh, back together. Uh, th th thanks for, for those of you that came. There are meetings and presentations all over the world uh, um, you know, with, with the disorders being uh, highlighted uh, here. If you're missing, if, if any of your presentations for the coming year are missing, email Sophia uh, the details and she'll um, uh, make them known to others that might be attending those same meetings. Now, this is something for, for next year. So I was very lucky to meet uh, Dr. Ali Safet Gonul uh, and, and, and uh, Professor Shadash uh, Aker uh, in Izmir uh, and the SOCAT lab members that you see there. This meeting, ICP, will be held in, in, in Turkey, in fact, in Antalya uh, next October. And we're thinking of having an Enigma meeting there. I mean, it's a wonderful cultural experience in any case, but also the intellectual opportunities and meeting people from all over the uh, Middle East, Western Eastern Europe, and also India and Pakistan. It's a little easier if you look at the map in the middle uh, to remind you where, where this is. It's a little more convenient to uh, go to a meeting there if you live in Enigma or Pakistan. Uh, so we may have a pre-meeting uh, before ICP. And if you're interested, reach out to us because it'd be interesting to know who might be interested uh, to come to that. It's a re really wonderful place and wonderful people. Um, Finally, uh, there's a, a special issue led by Perry Pascu and her colleagues on women in behavioral and psychiatric genetics, a uh, new, new special issue, Frontiers in Genetics. Um, do reach out to them if you'd like to contribute an article or mini review or even perspective uh, that highlights uh, work by uh, women scientists and allies of all genders. Uh, and so, I mean, that looks like a, a wonderful special issue with a deadline uh, about five weeks uh, from now. Job postings, I do have a look. If you have a job available, send it to Sophia and she'll uh, advertise it on the Enigma website and also in, in, in uh, um, newsletters. Uh, these look like fun uh, opportunities. Uh, do, do reach out to the folks uh, listed there. And uh, I don't know, Sophia, if you have a, a quick summary of any final remarks for, for, the, for the members that are listed here. Um, yeah, well, I think uh, you covered pretty much everything. This is just um, some core links. I think everyone already has access to all these, but if you want to sign up for our newsletter, um, feel free to click on that link. Um, and it's great to see everyone join today. And thanks for joining, even though it's nearing holiday season and everyone's uh, winter or summer, depending on your hemisphere uh, vacation. So great to see everyone. Thanks, Sophia. And I, I just want to say, I mean, obviously, um, I'll stop sharing. Uh, yeah, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to you, Sophia. I mean, I think you you have probably been on 200 Enigma calls this year, and as well as the calls, all of the masterminding of the communications behind the entire consortium. I mean, we we hugely indebted. And huge thank you to Meta Jahanshad, Chris Ching, uh, Lauren Salmon, and uh, many other members of the USC team who support uh, everything that we're doing behind the scenes. Um, and I think we were going to have a photo. Now, th this may or may not be 
um, interesting to you, depending on which time zone you're in. But if you'd like to be in a photograph, um, do do switch your Zoom camera on, and we will. Uh, um, my goodness, there's so many brilliant people here. This is this is really fun. Thanks so much, all of you, for for joining. Um, I think Sophia had an idea of how you take a photo on a Zoom call, which is you you make a video of it. If any of you are interested in doing this for your own working groups, you make a video of it and then you scroll through. Um, and if people don't like how they look on Zoom, you can send her a photo, uh, your preferred photo of yourself uh, as well. Gosh, it is so wonderful to see everyone. I wish we could all be all be together. Um, and if, if you are at in-person meetings, um, do, do give us a shout. I mean, we, we will have probably an in-person meeting in San Diego here in California for SOVP, probably one in Montreal for human brain mapping. And uh, I think everyone should agree to come to Turkey uh, in uh, October of next year. Thanks to uh, Dr. Ali and Dr. Shradas for, for su suggesting that. So uh, I sort of ran out the clock. I must apologize. So my clock, I just ignored it. And so, I mean, if you have a clock, you have to remember to pay attention to it. Um, but we do have, um, we, it's it's one eighteen here. We have maybe five, 10 minutes if folks have uh, any final remarks, announcements, uh, ideas. Um, we, we never have all of us together. It's a bit like the British royal family. We don't have everyone together because it's too dangerous. <laughs> so, so <laughs> if you if you have any spontaneous remarks um, that you'd like to add, uh, I mean, other than that, I just want to say I'm just immensely indebted uh, to all of you for making Enigma what it is. And I think when this began 13 years ago, nobody would have ever imagined that the power of scientific activity uh, would have uh, evolved on this scale. And thanks to each and every one of you for, for making this just a tremendous journey. I think uh, we all wish you a restful holiday. Hopefully you'll have uh, some time off in the coming uh, week and uh, time to reflect on uh, all the achievements of, uh, of your last year, which have been <laughs> terrific. <laughs> Does anyone, uh, Dr. Zellman, do you, do you have a final remark? Dr. Zellman, <laughs> so, I see you. You know, Paul, um, all members, I really would like to thank you all very much. And I hope really that, you know, today's presentation is really uh, something that scientists don't need visas and countries should not have borders. And really it's so amount of work done by Enigma that I believe it's the base for future good time. And we hope it will be good time. And I know that my colleagues from Russia, like from Ukraine and former Soviet Union will join us and will continue to work together because, you know, cognitive function and mentality is the most important things to treat people who sometimes created bad things. And we need to do it. Thank you, my friend, Dr. Zelman. Dr. Zelman was born in Ukraine uh, before the Second World War and has had a lifetime of creating alliances across the world. So thank, thank you for being with us, uh, with us today. Well, I, I cannot second those eloquent remarks. So if, you, if, if anyone has any final... Uh, Final comments, please speak now. And if not, uh, we will see you again uh, in the new year. I think, Paul, that we are all so grateful for all the good work that you and your team are doing. And, and I think all of us now joining this telco are very grateful for all, all the work you're doing. Thanks so much, Adil. So anyway, with much appreciation, uh, we'll wish you a safe next couple of weeks. and. Uh, a, a wonderful and, and, and happy new year. Congrats on all of your work this year. We will see you in the new year. All right, bye-bye for now from Los Angeles. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, bye. bye. Thanks, bye. Bye. Thank you, bye.